It sounds so easy. Master vacuum distillation and then create the gin that Alessandro Palazzi has selected for the most famous martinis in the world at Duke's Bar in London. But as our guests today, Ian Hart and Hilary Whitney of Sacred Spirits know, it's not as easy as all that. What is easy is checking out our Lush Life merchandise at www.alushlifemanual.com backslash merch. I'm trying to convince Alessandro to serve his martinis in the Lush Life mug. We can always hope and dream. You can serve yours in one, and at the same time, you're helping to support this very podcast. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. We were talking gin with Ian and Hillary, more specifically vacuum distillation, which they are both pros of now. But there was a time when Ian's neighbors feared for their lives. It really is amazing how he is still alive. Uh, I grew up in Highgate, so within about a mile of where we are now. The first house was Chomney Crescent, and the second house was Talbot Road, which I moved into in 1973. So you pretty much haven't left this area? Apart from, you know, the odd couple of years here and there. Huh. And Hilary? So I was uh, born and brought up in Norfolk, which I'm very proud of. Um, uh, very, very close near to Jamie Baxter, actually, although I didn't know him when we were younger. And um, I moved to London when I was in my early 20s, so I've been here um, a long time now, over 30 years. Okay, we'll start with Ian. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I read somewhere that you started distilling when you were young, so you have to tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, my father had an old chemistry set, which was tucked away, and I discovered all sorts of really interesting and dangerous uh, chemicals in there, dated from like the 1940s. Uh, And he was pretty excited to see me playing with the stuff that he used to play around with as a kid. And I I would have been about 11 years old, and I was reading textbooks from the 1940s, his old school textbooks, with like all kind of experiments in there that you'd never be allowed to do nowadays. And I just did that stuff, and I was distilling um, oxides of nitrogen, oxides of chlorine, some real real, um, funky stuff which you would never normally get to do. I know, I saw a television program where it was like, Things that could kill kids in the 50s. I think it was that exact chemistry. <laughs> now, did, how did you know what to do? Was it was it in the handbook and it, was, it came with these I, little vials? Well, essentially, so my father had collected probably 80 or 90 uh, different vials, pots of all sorts of yeah, dangerous chemicals. Uh, the kind of thing you'd never get in a chemistry set, even back in the 70s. This is 1940s stuff that he had collected. Plus, I had two stained... Uh, kind of real um, slightly damaged chemistry textbooks from the 1940s and I systematically went through those textbooks doing the experiments. And what, like, what, do you remember any of the exact experiments yeah, or one so, that so, like, so burned down the house? Or? Do you want to mention the one where the neighbours... I made up a few of my own after that. Um, <laughs> this was not in the chemistry book but my mother thought that uh, my body would have been shredded and hanging in pieces from the tree in the back garden. So that was uh, take. Um, Sorry to laugh. This, <laughs> you take a handful of calcium carbide and a teaspoon of potassium permanganate and um, a few pints of hydrogen peroxide, and you put them dry and in a plastic container, ideally inside a dustbin liner, or I was actually using an empty fertilizer sack. You seal up the dustbin liner or fertilizer sack, and you tip over the hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide touches the potassium permanganate and generates pure oxygen. The water in the hydrogen peroxide solution interacts with the calcium carbide and generates acetylene. Now you've seen an oxyacetylene lamp, which is used for cutting steel. So you get it like a, a dustbin liner of eight, 80 litres of this stuff. And I, I knew that was going to burn well. So I lit a match from about 10 feet distance and threw it underneath the sack. And so what happened? Somehow the neighbours were involved because Hillary let that out. No, well, that, that was a different one. Actually. All right. <laughs> so what that, happened? That's probably to this the one? loudest explosion I've ever heard. And it's very sharp and real thunderclap. And there's a big white flash at the same time. It's like the whole world changes in an instant and you can't hear anything. Did people come running or did only you hear this? Was it in the garden? It was kind of after lunch, getting back from school or something like that. So most people would be out, out at work, I think. Oh my god! Oh my god! But, but you were fine, right? I was fine. You were fine, yeah. except you couldn't hear that. 
it's a good no, party trick. Isn't no it? wonder you ended up as a distiller now. But so you had, as a child, you were really interested in this oh, yeah. sciencey yes. stuff. So um, did well, you always know that you were going to pursue science? I mean, yeah, because the man? Man, when I'd started getting to grips with this, these chemicals, my, my father's chemistry textbooks, I started working out how to do things myself, hence the acetylene reaction. Uh, and I was also using uh, bleach and hydrochloric acid to generate um, chlorine gas, bubbling it through sodium bromide solution, generating bromine. And one of our neighbours looked over the fence and said, what are you doing? What's that smell? And he, of course, had been in the Second World War, not the First World War at that stage. And uh, they went to a hospital. They checked themselves in because they were worried about the chlorine that was coming over the garden fence. And as I say, uh, obviously, you wouldn't do these things now. You but, weren't the most uh, popular kid in the neighbourhood. They're like, oh, no. Oh, no. Ian's playing again. And um, no one should do this themselves. Or it's like, why doesn't he just play sports? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I was really uh, into it from a young age. And all of the, I was just completely and utterly into it and getting hold of things, generating exotic substances, and um, interested in a bit of pyrotechnics, making things go bang. Uh, but I gave it all up in my uh, late teens. Um, why? I think it was getting a bit... I th- people will forgive you when you're 14 or 15. Okay. When you get to sort of like 18 or 19, you become sort of more criminally culpable. <laughs> so I th- I... <laughs> decided it would be too much heat, to be honest. Uh-huh. And also, I'd survived that far without blowing anything off. All right, so it was... It was good, like when you're it's definitely a decision to stop it. Yeah. Um, but then you studied science, right? Yeah, so I uh, studied natural sciences, medical sciences at Cambridge University for three years. Then I went down to study at UCL, actually from like a clinical medicine point of view, that was not a match for me. Mm. So the science and the academic side of things, yes. Looking after sick people, no. So you you kind of you put that all into what you thought was going to be a medical career. Yeah, I come oh. from a big family of medics, and so to okay. a certain extent, I was guided into it. But ultimately, when it came down to it, the science thing, yes, the um, uh, blood and guts thing, no. Mm-hmm. And um, so you were left not doing the medical thing. What what did you think you were going so to do? So that stage, I was do? actually on the side. I was running a cellular telephone company. This is a time when uh, cellular telephones were like big things, bricks and connected into cars and things like that. Uh, and at that stage, I was running a company which was selling about 25% of all cell phones sold in London. So it was actually, but that wasn't a lot because they were still over a thousand pounds each. Right, this is the so, early yeah. years, right? We're 90s, right? Uh, that company went bust in 1990 because I uh-huh. over-leveraged, over-expanded, over-exposed what I was doing. And ultimately, when the recession of 1990 hit, um, a whole lot of my customers became insolvent. They couldn't pay me. I couldn't pay my... So then I was neither a doctor nor a businessman at that particular stage. So I decided to, with my remaining savings, to take myself off to UC Berkeley in California to study, well, sort of like MBA, financial engineering. And that's how I got involved into finance. So so you got in, you you got into Berkeley and so... Oh, which is great. I love yeah. it. Was, it was two years in uh, the East Bay in California. And yeah, it's, it's sunshine, blue sky. You know, and one of the best universities best. in America. Yes, mm-hmm. So that was good. And that landed me a job on Wall Street as a proprietary trader, sort of fixed income arbitrage trader. Were you ever <clears> missing <throat> the little boy who was blowing up things? Yeah, but I was always cognizant that... I, all, I had all my fingers and eyes and stuff. And really? <laughs> that was the medic yeah. in you. It was the dual, like the, yes. the angel and the devil, yeah. right? So on I, your shoulder. So the medic was always saying, okay, you have the medic on your shoulder. Okay, you've got everything. You've got so everything. I, for what I got up to in my mid-teens, uh-huh. I'm very lucky that I'm still around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was fine. So yeah, you so said, okay, banking. Thing. Banking yeah. is safe, kind yeah. of. <laughs> At least to your body. That's quite a stressful part of banking I was in, though, because you're basically putting bets and hoping that the next movement in interest rates, you've got it right, or if you've got it uh, wrong, not, you make, try to make, either make more than you lose or make, win more, more frequently than you lose, and then look at what your profit and losses. And then you get events like the long-term capital crisis and the Russian crisis of the late 90s at this particular stage, and that was the end of me for proprietary trading. I got involved in recruiting, you know, headhunting. So you're really, that little boy was still there, but he was taking chances on different things with yeah, a lot be. more... Definite yeah. risk taker. Yeah, definite risk taker, yes. 
Yeah, it could be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then you said you went into headhunting. So an old Cambridge friend of mine had always been doing this. So I'd always been in, not always been, but I'd most recently been in the financial markets as a quantitative trader. And he'd been in the uh, same business, but as a recruiter. And he actually stuck one of my friends next to me on a seat. Uh, so he was kind of recruiting into the kind of jobs I was in. So when I left that business, I was quite a good match. So we worked as a team for a few years, uh, getting sort of PhD candidates into JP Morgan, Lehman, Goldman Sachs. And that's, that's the word, isn't it? Lehman. <laughs> so by 2006, people think that the financial crisis started in 2008, from my right. point of view. Bear Stearns and, and, uh, Bear Stearns and BNP Paribas suspended redemptions in their credit derivatives funds in July 2006. So that is when things went dead from my point of view. Mm-hmm. And I decided to sit down with a soldering iron and an oscilloscope and start trying to make things because there was no business to be had, despite the fact it took nearly two years for Lehman finally to go down. My line of business ended in July 2006 for exactly the same reasons that ultimately caused Lehman, etc., to go bankrupt. Now, before we get into your distilling life, Hillary, have you, where were you... At that point, so, so when did you well, when did you meet and well, first of all, I'm completely different to you in the fact that I'm very arts orientated i I'm not interested in science particularly I'm not a risk taker and um, yeah, I think that so I always worked in the arts, I studied film and drama, I worked at Penguin Books and Faber and Faber, and then I worked at the young Vic, uh, then I was a theatrical agent for a while, and then I was a freelance journalist. So that was my background, and um, I was working as a journalist when Ian started the gin. Although we started it together because I always helped, but I was still writing while um, we started. When did you meet? Uh, 1992. So right after the cell phones? Yeah. And just then, before I went to UCB. And just before, uh-huh. yeah. and did I, you go to Berkeley with him? No, I didn't. All right. I've been many times since, and I love it, but um, no, I didn't. Uh, so... Um, we met, Ian went to Berkeley. When he came back from Berkeley, we got together. All right. And, but you were a journalist then? Uh, what, no, when uh, I met Ian, I was actually working at the Young Vic Theatre. Mm-hmm. All so, right, so he loses, he, the financial crisis hits, you decided to regroup. Um, and you were then working as... I was, a, oh, well, uh, I was then working at the Arts Council, actually. Yes, I've done lots of different things in the drama department of the Arts Council. When Ian and I got back together again, and then I started freelance writing very shortly after that. Okay. So, you come home and you start to play. Had you always played with distilling while you were working as a hunter? hunter? I first started by teaching myself electronic engineering using an oscilloscope. And uh, so I bought a few things off eBay, like an old 1970s or 50s or 60s oscilloscope for XREF, and started teaching myself how to use... Uh, integrated circuits and just bit by bit get my skill up and up and up and start to uh, design things and make things. And that took me to uh, trying to design a a radar system to detect um, people carrying knives and guns and things like that. That's what I was trying to do, like scanner, cell phone frequencies. Uh, That actually didn't work out in the end. And that was a turning point where I decided to get my first vacuum still. How was that leap? How you know? Why did you decide to get a still? Sorry, just yes. I was just going to say because I think um, what Ian didn't make for that bridge was that when he started um, doing all the uh, electric on, electronic business, it, it was trying to find. Um, he's quite entrepreneurial, so it was another way to find a business to create a business. Hmm. Whereas I would have probably gone out and found a job. Ian would always look for a way to create a business. So that's what that was about. And then I had a number of different products in yeah. mind. <laughs> Ultimately, I was aiming at a hand. So the inventor radar. came back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you bought your first vacuum. With the intention of doing some, because this radar thing, I was keeping to blowing my circuits and they were overheating and for all sorts of reasons that I didn't completely understand. So I thought, here's the time to make it. Sorry, my tongue's rumbling like mad. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided it was time to uh, stop and do go on a completely different tack. I'd always thought about because I've been trading Bordeaux wine since I was 18 years old. And I've known a fair amount about certain problems with ripe but uh, wet vintages. And I thought there must be a way of taking a wine that 
because of its right but in a wet vintage is trading maybe 20 pounds a bottle perhaps you could reduce the water in it intensify it a bit more and bring it up to the standard of the same chateau that would be maybe trading at 80 pounds a bottle simply by dismantling the wine taking out some water and reassembling it so that I decided would have to be done through vacuum distillation under argon or carbon dioxide atmosphere with liquid nitrogen condensers, etc. And that's how I got into vacuum distillation. Okay, well, we have to back up for a second. You said that since you're 18, you've been trading wine yes. and buying wines. Yeah. Where did that love of wines come in? I had a friend of mine who, in his year off between school and university, uh, worked for a local wine merchant in Hampstead, it was, near Highgate, and he said, oh, there's some Lafitte's here which I can get for staff discount and it's less than the rising market. It's less than, you could sell it for more than we can buy it for. Shall we get a few cases each and see if we can't sell it for a profit? So we did and we did. Uh, and I realised that there's a lot of wine merchants around at that particular stage where, because the market's been rising, they have purchased their wholesale stock, put it on the shelves for their usual markup, but the market's more than caught up and therefore the market let's say if an auction house is trading for way more than they've got it on the shelves for so obviously you can buy it off their shelves auction it off for more and that bit by bit i worked out who's the buyers who are the sellers i still do business with them to this day from time to time and i've got sort of a good reputation of um, high quality uh, seller conditions so people know my name a bit like a affina of cheese and uh, so i've always been in the business so you've always life. had your toe in yes. the spirits industry since you're 18, really. Drinks industry. industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be, Sorry, yeah. drinks yeah. industry, yeah. of course. Um, since you're 18. So finally the worlds collide. You buy this vacuum distillation set. And so, so what was... Out. So your first thought was to, I'm going to do something with wine, the, the, the alcohol I know. We engineer. Yeah. What were you thinking of doing with the wine? You know, were you thinking of creating a different product? So I was very aware of the fact that different vintages, the 82 versus the 83, for example, got a big differential in price in the, in the secondary market. You know, auction houses, people are trading wine. So I'll pay you this, 80, so let's say by today's standards, uh, £600 for that vintage, but only £200 for, this, for a vintage which was one year later. And the main difference is because the later vintage had been rained on more than the, so the 83 had been rained on, the 82 had not. The 82 is trading at £600, the 82 is trading at £200. So it makes sense from a business proposition to see if you couldn't turn the 83 into the 83 into the 82 by taking some of that water out. So and would this be a completely new product? Yes, absolutely. Uh-huh. And did, so how did it go? I'm like, it, was, it, it must have been really, really exciting to try it. It does work. It does work. And you can do lots of more interesting things as well with uh, vintage ports uh, and so forth, you can really in- intensify them. And you can do weird things like, you can take the alcohol and bouquet of a white burgundy and put it onto a red burgundy. So you can do head and neck transplants, red burgundy onto white burgundy, white burgundy onto red burgundy and so on, uh, which is kind of interesting. But I realized it wasn't actually my product, whereas I was already, already uh-huh. thought that maybe at some stage, gin would be an interesting thing to look in. And I wondered if vacuum distillation might actually produce a high quality gin. So that that took me on to the next mm. level. So I guess it would be the product of the winemaker, really, because you're exactly. taking right. someone's yeah. wine and re-engineering, re- it. Yeah, re-engineering it and not going back to them, but trying to create a new product. Yeah, I don't think they'd be very pleased. No, <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, that's exactly. I mean, they spent years trying to perfect that one, yeah. you know, the yeah. exact wine they wanted. <laughs> so then, so when you thought, oh, that wasn't you, but hey, gin, gin might be a good idea. Yeah, so I mean, I, I started as the way most people would, which is to uh, go and buy a selection of botanicals, um, put them in a, in a flask, add some spirits, uh, warm them up, uh, distill them. And that's an interesting thing to do. Of course, that's how you'd start doing it. That's how gin typically is made. Uh, and I did it two or three times and realized that you couldn't adjust the proportions of the botanicals without starting again from scratch. So that took me to creating a library of individually distilled botanicals and blending them afterwards. That's one of the key things about what we do. Everything, in fact, we do is we take a botanical and distill it independently of any other botanical. Now, now, had you been a gin drinker before? To a certain extent, Mm -hmm. yeah. This was definitely the days when you still had 
uh, the bigger brands on the market. It was before the, the gin renaissance had given you such a huge choice mm-hmm. like you had today. So it was Hendrix was just beginning to come out. Uh, Bombay Sapphire had been the go-to premium gin for the past sort of five or ten years. Uh, so that that's the state of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd always been thinking about gins and how they would be constructed, how you'd make them. Uh, and I thought that nobody else was doing uh, vacuum distillation, so would it be interesting to make some gins at a lower temperature rather than heating them up? And it turns out, particularly with citrus, you get a much fresher, more exact, crisp style of distillate than if you use a hot copper pot still. So that, that's the difference in our distillates that we do today. But I'd also say that, never mind... Um you didn't think anyone else would be doing it using vacuum installation. I mean, not many people were doing it then at all. I mean, we started the same week as Sipsmith. I remember Ian coming back and saying, oh, there's some people in Hammersmith who are doing a gin. Do you know what I mean? And that was just a complete surprise. We didn't um, know anything about it. Yeah, it was not necessarily considered to... Well, it wasn't considered to be the cool sort of millennial drink that it is today. No, absolutely. Now, when he was buying all this paraphernalia... Mm -hmm. And stuffing the house with it, what what were you thinking? You know, is this going to be another crazy, you know, neighbours, something getting blown up? Or were you thinking, this is a great <laughs> well, idea? I didn't know, Ian, when he was doing the um, the other distillation things. But um, I just, I thought it was interesting. But um, Ian does have lots of passions. I just kind of, there's always something going on with Ian. There's always some project. So, yes, I, I thought it was another project did you were you the guinea pig to um, try every you know distillate it's really strange but um it's, it's quite a long time ago because we it's going to be our 10th anniversary of our first bottling next year but obviously we started doing it before then we used to go on a sunday evening to try out the recipes on the people in, who drink in our local pub and i used to taste them then but it's it's very hard to remember i mean some of them are pretty awful and then they've you know got better and better and better. So um, the other thing, interestingly, is that although I like gin cocktails, in those days I didn't really like gin and tonic, and I think that was to do with the tonic more. But at the time, I remember thinking, oh, I wasn't a big gin and tonic fan. So. Mm-hmm. so you were just using your your tasting, you know, your your experience drinking gin. You know, did did you have a dis- you were the blender, you were yeah. the distiller. Yes. Yeah. So, and so how did you know when you had hit gold and this is, you know, this is going to be sacred gin? Uh, a lot of trial and error, spreadsheets. The uh, final 23rd recipe that got us started uh, has got code uh, JJ because it's in a uh, spreadsheet column, which was, you know, H-I-J, <laughs> something like that. So it just happened to be something. Gin by Excel spreadsheet. Yes. No, that's just how you recorded the thing. It's not how you created the recipe. It's how you recorded No, no, just it. recorded it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have to get, one of the first things you learn, and that, this was instilled in me by Desmond Payne of Beef Eater. He said, it's all about being able to repeat what you last did and keep put some consistency in so that people will have one bottle from last year, one bottle from this year. It's the same product. So I knew that, and so I keep meticulous records from that point of view uh, but actually coming up with your recipe in my opinion first it's good tastes good first few ones I did way too much uh, uh, citrus way too much juniper fruit and then you start finessing it then you work out oh well that, that one's a bit more like Plymouth that one's a bit more uh, like uh, let's say the Tanqueray and there's no point putting a liquid on the market which tastes like any other of the gins on the market so then you w- work out how you're going to change the recipe to get a particular style it's your style mm-hmm. rather than a replica of somewhere else in the market. And to me, at that point, that was the most important thing. Put something onto the market which has the quality but also is different from the taste of other gins. So you must have been drinking a lot of gin before that to to really tasting. be able to... Yeah, tasting. this tasting to one thing I did figure out what each one that, tasted like. <laughs> you know, all of those. If you drink it while you're doing, doing your tasting, you'll forget what you're doing. So you definitely, definitely have to take it easy it has to be like a many months long process. Mm-hmm. Document what you're doing. Stop. So how long did it take you between deciding that you were going to distill gin to getting the 23rd one? Uh, probably uh, mid-2008 to bottling, our first bottling, which was early 2009. So just under a year. 
And did you just have that one? You had the one, number 23, Sacred Gen. We started mm-hmm. with one. Uh, now we have like 15 or 18 different mm-hmm. products in different categories. At that particular time, it was appropriate to back that one particular recipe, get it bottled, go through the process, start to understand how the market works, the microstructure of the market. The uh, gin market in the UK uh, is in- incredibly fiddly and counterintuitive. So we stuck, we just stuck with one, our main recipe. Uh, I designed the initial label, which is pretty useless, but there we go. Uh, and the liquid started selling. And, you know, you make some initial contacts and you avoid some bullets. And we developed our business from that point of view. There were all sorts of strange things we had to do. Like we had to go around canvassing local uh, on and off trade to say that they might be interested in stocking our product, but not obliged to and getting a name, contact details, so that you can start to uh, get evidence for customs and excise that you will decide that you'll, you, they should give you a license. So that's kind of one of the strange things that you never... So we were walking up and down the streets of North London, going into places, explaining what we're doing, doing some blank stares or all sorts of funny reactions. And bit by bit, we built, built up a few pages, five or six pages worth, a list of people who said they would back us. And then you show your bank account details to customs and excise to show you can execute your business plan and do cash flow forecasts and stuff and then they give you your license and then you have a business where you can store and bond and distribute and that's all a learning process as well of course now he's come up with number 23 Mm -hmm. hillary um did you think oh this is it this is i think this is the the thing my inventor you know partner has come up with that one product that you know, I think we're really, gonna really you're gonna hard. continue doing for ten years now. Well, I, I I was still doing my writing. I was also trying to write scripts at the time, actually, and I'd actually had a bit of um, I'd had, actually had some meetings with BBC and stuff, and I was kind of thinking, oh, this is where my career is going to go, but it didn't. And I was doing the gin, and also um, as everyone knows, um, journalism was getting harder and harder, and, and um, paying less and less proportionally so although I always you know I was always doing the gin with Ian eventually I stopped writing and did the gin full time but did I ever think no it was just something we were doing I never thought this is it this is going to be the great business you know it it was just something that we were doing and again because the jinx industry well as far as I know because I hadn't been part of it before wasn't like it is now so um, the story I always tell is that I used to carry a little sample bottle of our gin around and I went to a concert and there was another journalist I knew there who was in his 20s and he tasted some he said it's very nice he said but you know who's going to buy it no one no one drinks gin these days you know <laughs> and that kind of thing would make my heart sink a little um, but then gradually we started well we got some press we were very lucky with um, our first customers one of our first customers was Jerry's in Old Compton Street who helped us hugely um, and Alessandra, of course, at Duke's Hotel Bar. And um, we were also, um, Fortnum and Mason was one of our first listings. Um, so that gave us sort of credibility to sell to other people. But it was odd. I mean, like I can remember Ian coming home and saying, Fortnum and Mason wants us to do a tasting at Christmas on the shop floor. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness. And I was thinking, well, what does one wear for a, a tasting on the shop floor? <laughs> I didn't have any idea what it was like, what you what you do. And then you just go and do it. And it's like we do them all the time. It's perfectly normal. And, um, you wouldn't think twice. But, you know, I was thinking. So I, when you got to that first tasting, yeah, um, were you surprised about how many people? I mean, what was like, what was, what was surprising then? Do you remember? Um, Surprising how much, because of course you've been quite entrenched in it, surprising how much you have to explain to people, particularly then, um, about gin and what it is and why ours was different. And and of course then also, because people weren't used to small distilleries, people found it very amusing. You know, oh, ho, 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 in your house and that kind of thing. And uh, the other thing which I found uh, annoying, and I still do find annoying, is people used to say to me, oh, you let him take over your kitchen. Um, that's so good of you. Well, Ian does all the cooking anyway. So it was his kitchen. I don't think they life. would say that today, yeah, no, with this era, no. <laughs> even in no, 10 years. They do. They do still say that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, um, uh-huh. but uh, but it was a whole new world. And, um, and it was much smaller. Quite a few of us who were working with Jen 
got together socially. There was quite a social aspect to it. So it was very, it was very good fun. I think it's a lot more sharp elbows now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I guess now that's such a, a story. You, you are the storyteller now yeah. for a gin. So you may be not writing fictional stories, but you're writing, you're creating the story of gin, of sacred gin now. Yeah. So yeah. you've become a storyteller in a different way, yeah. yes. I guess. Well, we'll see. Watch the space for the next for the next twenty years (laughs) for the next ten years and twenty years. So you have number you have your number twenty three, and it's you're doing tastings at Fordham. And um, when did you decide to create other products? The first thing was that one of our uh, supporters, local pub, uh, the Wrestlers, just around the corner from where we where we were distilling. Uh, they're saying, you know, we sell lots of vodka as well. Have you thought about doing some vodka? They said, no, you have not thought about doing vodka. Um, and bit by bit. Why did you have that initial reaction? Because I think gin is interesting. Uh-huh. And I thought vodka, to my mind, was more of a sort of mainstream commodity product. And I still uh-huh. think that. Mm-hmm. There are some great vodkas out there. Uh, and we produce uh, a great organic spirit which is, you know, makes a great Bloody Mary, uh, and so on. But we hadn't thought that it should be part of what we do, because what we were doing was taking botanicals and redistilling them to to a recipe. So it didn't seem to be initially a great match. But then we realised that we should really be produce something for those bars. It had to be made with proper integrity. It would be interesting, because some people have vodka, despite the fact I'm not much of a vodka drinker myself, I'm much more interested in gin, it's a, it goes down the same distribution lines, it goes to the same customers, you know, you have to pay your bills at some stage, so we started producing vodka and it took off very well, so mm-hmm. we do supply a lot of our organic vodka, and we also initially did a, a spiced vodka, which has since been renamed London Dry Vodka, which nobody really understands, <laughs> it's a sort of intersection between gin and vodka. It's a gin without juniper and it's so therefore it's not a gin, it's a vodka. Anyway, the point is it's a, it's a flavoured vodka. We realised that we actually sold quite a lot to the same bars and to a certain extent, but lesser extent uh, retail. The bars that were buying our gin also took a fair amount of vodka as well. So it made sense to, to put them both into those on trade customers. Mm-hmm. So then we had a portfolio of uh, two or three different spirits products. Started playing around with uh, mulled wine and thinking about what happens to a mulled wine when you put it aside, strain it, bottle it, put it in the refrigerator, and realising that if you make a mulled wine with our distillates, when we have botanically distilled cinnamon and clove and orange peels rather than the solids, that you could actually put together some wine, some clove and cinnamon and orange distillates some sugar, put it in a bottle, put it aside, put it in the fridge, take it out afterwards. That's interesting. You've got a that tastes like a vermouth. So we're thinking, is that is vermouth something that could potentially be marketed alongside uh, our gin and vodka? And so we were discussing it with Alessandro at Dukes and of course he uses a lot of vermouths for his martinis and martinez and cocktails. Uh, so after our initial Sort of spiced, rich, dark uh, vermouth that we put onto the market. We also produced two initially exclusive white vermouths for Alessandro, which are currently used as his house pour uh, martini, extra dry vermouth, or English dry, and an amber to make Vespa martinis. He had exclusivity for uh, three years on both of those, but now they're generally available onto the market. And so we were in a position where we had uh, one gin, two vodkas three vermouths, so realised that when you're making a delivery somewhere, quite often they'll want six or twelve gin. But if they'll take six or twelve gin, they might also add to the order six vermouth, six vodka. So I thought, okay, so so it's really important at our scale, in terms of distribution, to be making larger deliveries to customers rather than just odd ones. If you think about the cost of the, the logistics and the distribution of one case versus five cases, the per bottle amount is dramatic. So part of our business plan then became to develop a portfolio of good liquids, well packaged, that would actually complement each other. And that's proven to be 
a pretty important um, scaling strategy from our point of view. But it has been an organic, I don't mean in terms of um, organic products, although in fact all our botanicals mainly are organic, but they've kind of grown, like obviously Vermis goes very well with gin and then um, we did the rosehip cut because we thought if we had something like Campari we could make our own Negronis and then you think, oh, but then you could do a pre-batch Negroni. So it all, it's also kind of, it's not been kind of cynically planned it's kind of just growing really no no that's what it sounds like definitely yeah. and yeah. obviously your both of your brains are always creating since you're small both of you are creators so you know that was the next thing I was going to kind of bring up was you know how did you go from one to the other but it has totally been organic so yeah. for the for the rose hips uh, it came out of a it uh, came out of a thing we're thinking of uh, Negronis, we're, thinking, you were we're thinking yeah we've got we've got a gem we've got a vermouth um, if we had something like Campari, we could do our own. And then the extra dry uh, vermouth came from Alessandro asking us to do it. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, it's just been um, like that. And, and products that complement gin originally, that's how it kind of grew. Has it surprised you how much the gin market has grown in yes. these 10 years? That's, yes. That's amazing. It is incredible. Mm-hmm. We knew Jake when he had, uh, sorry, Jake, it's Jake's surname. Jake from Portobello, we knew Jake went, but Jake Uh, Berger, mm -hmm. um, as somebody who owned a bar, and then when I found out he was going to have a gin, I'm thinking, oh, I wonder how that's going to go, because there's quite a few gins on the market now, and you think about it, I mean, there was nothing then compared to... There's 20-something now, there was 400. I thought there were about 20, and I thought, oh, and he'll have a bit of competition with with Sipsmith being in West London as well, and of course, it was completely different, it didn't even, it didn't matter, because, you know... There's hardly anything then, and he's done very well. Absolutely. They have a hotel. Yeah. But um, back to you guys. Um, so what, what do you, are you still constantly creating new products? Yeah, there's got to be very careful. There's a balance between creating no new products versus creating too many. So I, I like the idea of consistently having a thought about what you might do at some stage in the future. Uh, and play around with them and maybe come up with such a product. So, for example, uh, we do our own uh, absinthe for our bar, but at the moment I don't consider it's appropriate to commercialise it for, mm-hmm. for a number of reasons. Uh, same with bitters. We have some pure uh, quinine bark uh, bitters, which are great, but we're not going to commercialise it for the time being. So they're things which are there in the background. So we actually have behind our 15 or 18 uh, main SKUs, which is a lot for a small company like us. Uh, there's probably at least another... 20 or 30 products that we have interest in or that we produce in very small quantities uh, and so on. So we got, we're got developing a portfolio of liquids that we might use in the future, but we wouldn't, so for instance, next year we have plans really to, to launch uh, one, and that's actually a repackaging of our existing alter, English alternative to Campari and Aperol, our Rosette Cup. So it's a proven liquid now. It's got some good traction, but the label wasn't quite up to it, and I think our new packaging is great, so it's developing an existing product rather than bringing something completely new to the market. And I think that's probably the right strategy for us right now is to work on our existing portfolio, uh, positioning, pricing, formula, what, what it looks like. Is it going to get onto that shelf next to that bottle? So I'm not that keen at the moment on putting any more liquids out there. I'm more focused on developing what we've got. Because but remember, as we're very small, we don't have lots of money to throw at things marketing-wise, so we have to be really careful what we do and um, we rely on sort of being placed in some really good places and that's how we have to do it so the repackaging has been very important well can we go and try some of your um, things that are in your bar right here yes you can. on chester road yes <laughs> all right the sun had risen by seven thirty today which means spring is on its way and with it the need to have a cool, refreshing beverage, which leads us to our cocktail of the week, the sacred rosehip spritz. Here is Ian to tell us how he conceived it. For a long time, uh, the market for spritz has been dom- dominated by Aperol, and I do like it, what a wonderful colour it is, the bitterness, the, bit of the sweetness, it's fantastic. We decided that we would produce an English alternative using completely natural colour. We use grape skins. It still has the bitterness. It has a beautiful, rich red colour. The advantage from the point of view of uh, 
a top end bar or restaurant looking for an alternative to the alcohol spritz, which is everywhere, is to have a sacred rose of hip spritz. They can sell it for a little more, completely natural ingredients, and it's something to enable a bar or restaurant to differentiate themselves, to have the same fantastic offering of beautiful red spritz fizzy drink, but actually it's an alternative which is English and completely natural ingredients. So you'll need sparkling wine, sacred rosehip cup, soda water, and a slice of orange, plus loads of ice. Take a large wine glass and fill it with ice. Add the sparkling wine, sacred rosehip cup, and soda water in a 3 to 1 ratio. This means either 3 ounces or 90 ml of sparkling wine, 2 ounces or 60 ml of sacred rosehip cup, and 1 ounce or 30 ml of soda water. Then top it up with the orange slice. Of course, you can also make a jug of it using those dimensions. And don't forget to add plenty of ice and slices of orange. As you know, you'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week on alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. Next time on Lush Life, we'll be in Annecy, France, to meet Nino Fovac, winner of the Havana Club Grand Prix. I won't bore you with how our flights got canceled both going and returning from Annecy, but I will tell you how amazing her story is and how having the right mentor, innate talent, and overflowing enthusiasm can win you the big ones. Remember to check out a lushlifemanual.com backslash merch for your new iPhone cover. It really helps us to bring you this very podcast every week. And that's my pitch. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast. For more information and links to everything you've heard, plus a whole lot more, please visit alushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. The music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra, and I'm your drinking partner, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar. <laughs>